Joseph Sobrand, newspaper columnist and senior editor with National Review, you write in this morning's Washington Times, why not be honest about it? The film was propaganda, dishonest propaganda, made the more objectionable by dishonest promotion. ABC officials should say it was merely a what-if movie, but it was plainly meant as prophecy. Why are conservatives so upset about this movie? Well, I'm upset about it because the, uh, the media have been tending to uh, especially ABC in this case, have been tending to accept the left, left wing premises without criticism. At the same time, they say they're neutral. The premise they accepted here was that deterrence doesn't work. It's worked fine. We don't have to choose between nuclear war and disarmament. We can have both. The movie implied there's a disjunction between them. Joseph Silbrand, as we said, is a senior editor with National Review. He's been with that organization for 11 years headquartered here in Washington, writes a column for the Los Angeles Times Syndicate, is a 1969 graduate of Eastern Michigan University. Where is that? In Ypsilanti, Michigan. Your hometown? Yes. You're not married? Obviously no. have no children. No. Well. <laughs> Let's look at uh, the front page of the Washington Times this morning, uh, of the commentary section that is, and the whole page is devoted to the subject of a day after the ABC movie. It's not enough to cry peace. This is a Smith Hemstone column. He is the executive editor of the Washington Times. He closes off by saying, uh, of one thing only can be sure. None of us is going to get out of this world alive. Only the time and manner of our passing are open to question. Need we then fear it so much? Saying that the movie put a lot of fear in people's hearts. Oh yes, it was designed to inspire fear, obviously. Why? Well, <sighs> Uh, I don't know exactly. There's no single motive in these things. The scriptwriter Edward Hume is a is a, uh, an advocate of disarmament, and the assumption is that by getting rid of weapons, you get rid of the problem. But the problem is not weapons. England and France are nuclear powers, with a long uh, historic rivalry. But they don't have. Uh, 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 there's no present danger of nuclear war between them. The Soviet Union is the problem not nuclear weapons. You go into, in your column this morning, um, another interesting sidebar on this that uh, I've not seen written a lot about. It says, uh, in typical Hollywood liberal fashion, Christianity was noticed only to be ridiculed. A real American community in terrible peril would do a good deal of praying. In the day after, there is only one scene of prayer in which a hysterical clergyman cites an absurdly inappropriate passage of scripture offering his congregation no comfort at all. The tacit message was that God is not going to save us, we can only save ourselves. Yes. The, the operative God of these people is the Soviet Union. The ultimate reality is death for them. Uh, and, and the Soviet Union having the power to inflict death becomes an operative God. So that the, the way you deal with reality is to keep propitiating and appeasing and, and not provoking this terrible God. Any political fallout? Uh, much less than the Reagan administration feared, I think. In fact, I thought their reaction was hysterical. They, uh, they, they reacted his, as hysterically as they expected the public to. The, uh, the, the Secretary of State was dispatched to assure everyone that there would be no problem. I think that the uh, administration's fears matched the hopes of the producers which was uh, specifically the hope that the, uh, the masses would be mobilized by this, you know, and, and get uh, all agitated and march out and join the freeze movement and, and so forth. Notice in this morning's Washington Post, first we might take a look at what's on the front page. This is the day after a holiday, so uh, usually it's a foreign affairs uh, lead story. On drop-off warns Soviets will add sea-based missiles. Conventional weapon may go nuclear. That's a, a story that we could talk about at another time. It's more in-depth. U.S. backed rebels can't win in Nicaragua. CIA fines. And that is a story that comes out of a congressional hearing that was just released uh, over the weekend. Let's look inside. And I wanted to, to uh, there is a column inside by uh, Evans and Novak. Uh, panic over a horror movie. They talk about the, uh, according to Evans and Novak, there was strong consideration made for the president going to Capitol Hill uh, the last couple days of the session as a diversionary tactic to get people's minds off this on the evening news. And they decided, uh, according to Evans and Novak, uh, Senator Bob Byrd, who's the minority leader of the Senate, wouldn't go along with the meeting and all that. Uh, and they talk about inside uh, uh, 
debate that went on among the different aides. Uh, David Gergen was the, the uh, White House aide who most wanted to comment on the movie. In retrospect, uh, do you think that they went too far? Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. I, th I think they just panicked. The, uh, as they say, panic or over a horror movie. Uh, most people don't react all that strongly to a single movie. The, the, th the thing is, people are much less manipulable than, as I say, the producers hoped or the White House feared. Most people know when they're being manipulated. And, uh, it, you know, it was a horrifying movie, but at the same time, you, you know, you, anyone could tell, I think, that the, uh, the point of it was uh, political. That there, there were a lot of little lines that were geared to nudge you in the proper direction. Uh, there was the woman in the hospital saying, we knew this could happen for 40 years, nobody was interested. Well, how silly and how obvious. Evans and Novak write, thus White House day after panic was duly reported to the nation, an anguish wholly inappropriate to the impact of the film. Schultz spending his worst five minutes in a distinguished, uh, this is a strong statement, Schultz, meaning the Secretary of State, spending his worst five minutes in a distinguished public career was as boring as the film was emotional. On balance, the White House showed that in competing with the Republicans to manipulate the minds of voters, the Democrats need not abandon hope. Your reaction? Well, Schultz was uh, <laughs> the perfect guy to follow that movie because he certainly diffused the impact of it by being as boring as they say. In your column this morning, you talk about another aspect of this that I've not seen anywhere, and you say here, there was a curious abundance of sexual reference for a movie supposedly concerned only with one all-important issue. The hero, played by Jason Robard, showed what a fine, tolerant father, father he was by accepting by, with calm, good humor the news that his daughter was about to shack up with her boyfriend. Another father showed reactionary concern over a daughter's sexual behavior, but showed what a decent fellow he was, after all, by apologizing for scolding her so rudely. Hilarity was supplied by two sisters fighting over a diaphragm. Do you think that was, uh, uh, your analysis was, of the people who made the film was in, uh, wh why? Why would they, why would they, uh, concentrate, why would you concentrate on this subject? I wondered why they did. It seemed to me irrelevant to the point they were trying to make. It, it was as if they had showed the, the, uh, impact of nuclear war on a nudist camp almost, you know. It was, <laughs> why a nudist camp in particular? Uh, why not show church going people and so forth? Why not show a more representative cross section of, I won't say people, but of human activities? I mean, even, even people who lead busy sex lives uh, don't talk and think about it quite all the time, and whole populations don't. And I wondered, and I'm still not quite sure why, the uh, film should have concentrated so much on this in the first hour. Do you think this will have any long-range political impact on anything? Well, it could. You know, I think the short-term impact is small in a way, and yet the long-term impact may be a little different, maybe, maybe more. It's, it's hard to tell about these things. It may Reed, sink in in a way. Reed Irvine, who uh, is, a, is a chairman of Accuracy in Media, uh, which is a conservative organization that criticizes the media, on the, has a column also next to yours in the Washington Times this morning. He closes off his column by saying, they are also releasing the movie to be shown in West German theaters beginning December 2nd. An anti-nuclear uh, German said, quote, by releasing the day after now, we hope we can change the minds of people in our government about the missiles while there's still time, unquote. Will this have any impact, do you think, in the German society? Well, they seem to be ready to panic uh, a lot more than they were a few months ago. I don't know. It's possible. However, as I say, people, people are stubborn. There's another dimension of this. It's, it's a bank shot sort of thing. Uh, I like to define public opinion as what people think other people think. And so you, you find that... Uh, Everybody thinks everybody else is going to panic when this film is shown. The filmmakers don't expect it to have that impact on themselves. The administration doesn't expect to panic and change its mind, but they think everyone else is going to change their minds. And it's, it's easy to take a view of people as m being more manipulable than they are. On this day after Thanksgiving, the subject continues to be the day after movie on ABC. Uh, the full commentary page of the Washington Times this morning is devoted to commentary about what that movie meant and the political impact. Joseph Sobran is a senior editor of National Review, a conservative publication owned by Bill Buckley and uh, headquartered in New York, but your offices are here? Well, I live here. And you write also for the Los Angeles Times Syndicate. Could people around the country this morning see this column also in some of their newspapers? I suppose so. 
This was a L.A. Times syndicate yes. column then. How oh, many yes. do you write a week? Two. And how long have you been writing a column for the uh, syndicate? Four years now. Uh, I want to tell our audience that the phone lines are open at 202-628-2525 and 202-783-2727. Get your morning newspaper out. Uh, you may have opinions on the day after that don't require the morning newspaper. See if there's any uh, uh, talk maybe from the other side of the political fence this morning about the day after, whether or not, uh, do you think liberals uh, are happy that the film was shown? Well, in general, yes. Why? Well, it takes their view on, on uh, of nuclear war. In this morning's uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, this is being a Friday, uh, the Washington Wire section, which has a little tidbits of information and behind the scenes predictions on what's going on. Uh, down here is the thing, it says the right stuff, the much ballyhooed movie about the astronauts, a potential lift for Democrat Glenn, sags at the box office. Uh, it slips from fifth place to seventh among top grossing films, but a holiday boost could send it back up. Glenn's aides say the movie draws big crowds in diverse places, including Nebraska and Southern California. Question to you, another media event, uh, a lot of cover stories about the right stuff uh, as uh, what impact it would have on John Glenn. Do you think it's had any impact at all? And if, if so, what is that? Well, there again, everybody, including myself, thought this movie was going to be a big boost for Glenn. And it doesn't seem to be at all. Uh, uh, in a sense, that's where I learned the lesson that was reinforced by the day after. Uh, people uh, don't really travel in herds quite as much as, uh, as we tend to think. Have conservatives uh, overreacted then, and along with the administration, there's a lot of, in the conservative Washington Times this morning, a lot of copy about this movie. Is that overreaction? Well, in a way, uh, it, it depends. Uh, we didn't all three get together and say, let's write three columns about this movie. We, we each wrote our own in, uh, independently, and uh, it came out that way. Let's go to the phones. We have a couple lines open uh, from the West at 202-783-2727. Remember our 30-day policy. If you've called us within the last month, please hold off and let others participate. Our first call in the morning is from Dallas, Texas. Go ahead, please. Good morning, folks. How you doing? I, I was rather interested in the fact that nobody so far has mentioned uh, that this movie was a direct attack upon the NATO alliance. In case after case in this movie, it was uh, statements that, oh, we are, we're not going to go to nuclear war because of West Germany, maybe it was the Persian Gulf, that would be different. In every case in this movie, any overt violence was done by either the United States or other members of the NATO alliance. For example, the first actual crossing of a border after the, you know, un, uh, the, you know, the blockade of Berlin, which of course was caused by unrest in East Germany, which was caused by the crews and Persian missiles, which of course they cut out because it was too inflammatory. The first crossing of border was done by Allied NATO forces. Do you think this was done on purpose, caller? Say what? Do you think this was done on purpose? Do you think there's any motive on the part of the people who made the movie on, uh, for, for any political reason? Oh, Yes, personally, I think that the writer is one of those ill who thinks the United States is primarily responsible for most of the foreign policy evils in the world. And if we just had more understanding of those guys, then they would just show what good fellows they were and be nice back to us. Okay. Uh, that's the, anyhow, as I was saying, in every case, when it comes to overt military action, shooting at someone using nuclear weapons, it's once again the U.S. and NATO. And the fact that everyone knew this is going to be shown in Europe later. It's interesting that of the four major character groups in the movie, you had two with Germanic names, Klein and Dahlberg. I think it's directly intended to essentially, well, subvert may be a bit of a strong word, but let's say criticize the U.S. participation in NATO. Caller, it sounds like you studied this situation. If you remember names and all that, why have you watched this thing so closely? Well, simply put, I've just been reading books like uh, KGB Today, The Hidden Hand, and when I start looking at this, I'm saying, who in ABC had this idea first? Did someone from outside ABC plant an idea into one of the and ABC producers? And how I noticed how all this anti-nuclear thing, the freeze campaign, all that, seemed to start all at once in various places. Now, it bespeaks some kind of central organization. Not, of course, the KGB isn't behind all of it, or most of it. But it has been shown that they have had their fingers in the pie, so to speak. All right.
right, sir. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Sobrand, the gentleman suggests there's more to this than meets the eye. Well, it could be. I wouldn't rule it out. People do scheme a good deal, uh, the, uh, the Soviets in particular. On the other hand, there's what I like to call the hive effect. Uh, I, I look on the whole left, uh, the liberal left, the communist left, the, uh, the sort of in-between left, nondescripts of various sorts. It's like a beehive. There are different kinds of bees in a hive and there's no central coordination, but they all seem to swarm in the same direction. They're all attacking Reagan at once. Speaker O'Neill attacks Reagan. Uh, Fidel Castro quotes him in his funeral oration for those heroic workers who died in Grenada, that sort of thing. You can count on the left as a whole to move uh, in the same direction. Some of the strongest criticism in this morning's paper comes from the conservatives, and here's on the front page of the Washington Times, I'm sorry, the, Washington, the New York Times, conservative study gives Reagan a mixed rating, and we can talk about this more as the hour goes on, but this is a Heritage Foundation study that in effect quotes major conservatives in this town, including Howard Phillips, we see a picture of here, Paul Weirich, Richard Vigory, uh, goes, I can go down the list later, but they all say, and I, again, we'll get into specifics. They like the direction that Mr. Reagan started out in, but they all have something to complain about, whether it be the abortion situation or uh, how do you view the president at this point in his career? Well, uh, I like him quite a bit. I think, again, he underestimates the support he commands. The, his most successful action recently was the Grenada invasion, where he didn't wait to take a poll. If he'd taken a poll the day before the invasion, everyone would have said, oh, no, don't invade, even people who might have thought it was a good idea. The day after, the nation was throwing its caps in the air, celebrating it. So uh, the, the lesson there is the sort of, uh, I don't know, the Napoleonic one, if you will. You act, and opinion crystallizes around action. You don't uh, take an opinion poll to guide you in action. Going way out west to the San Francisco Bay Area, Hayward, California, good morning. Uh, yes. If people were smart, they would look the day after August 7th and August 10th, 1945, because ABC goes out there and, and grabs them with this ratings game and show an unrealistic thing happening. All people have to do is look to that destruction, and they will see it. Now, already in, we are putting Pershing 2s in Europe. And drop-off pulls out of the talks today and says he's going to put in new missiles. So you tell me, what does ABC, you know, do about it? Do you think that the ABC movie was a good thing? No, I don't. It, it might have put it more in, you know, to the people, because when I went to work the next day, there were people talking about it, whereas before they weren't. But if it takes you know, a fictitious thing like that to get people talking, then maybe it is good, but maybe the ratings game got to them too. All right, sir. Then, Joseph Sobrand, what, what are the positive f effects of a movie like this from your political perspective? Well, uh, I think that it may have backfired as propaganda just because it was rather obvious what it was. The, uh, the, the ABC programming guy uh, what's his name? Brandon Stoddard, I think. Correct. Said uh, uh, that it, it was it was obviously an apolitical movie because the right was irritated and the left was jubilant, as if these things canceled each other out rather than confirming each other. The interesting one, uh, one other interesting thing uh, about this program that somebody observed to me the other day is that nobody uh, nobody in the movie blamed the Soviet Union at all. The uh, uh, and and you find that the blame. Uh, again, from the, from the liberals, the blame for the arms race always goes to Reagan. The blame for tensions in the world, it's all Reagan's fault. You'd think he, he was running the evil empire to hear them talk. Joseph Sobran of National Review to go to Richmond, Virginia. Good morning. Morning. You're I want to thank you, first of all, for making C-SPAN available to us. Thank you, sir. Go ahead with your comment or question. Well, I just tried to get through to you on several occasions had success, but... Uh, I think the liberals and the anti, uh, or the freeze people probably think they would get some support if they still had a Kennedy in the White House. But I think they remember, I don't remember this, but I was found an interesting quote from the time this past Tuesday in the editorial from Mr. Kennedy's inaugural address of January 20th, 1961. 
And this briefly says, we dare not tempt the Soviets with weakness, for only when the arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will not be used. And uh, he also says, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. And that's one or uh, two times that I agree with Mr. Kennedy. What did you, did you happen to watch the uh, movie we're talking about a day after? Well, I did not watch it. I heard enough about it from the hype and the comments before and after. I had no desire to watch it. Okay, thank you. In the uh, Washington Post uh, a couple of days ago, on uh, Wednesday, the 23rd, they had a front page story, Free Support Grows Slightly After War Show by Barry Sussman. They did a poll of, uh, I don't know, several hundred people. But in, the, in this poll, it also showed that from November the 3rd to the day after, the president's popularity went up by two percentage points. Do you think he benefits from all the discussion about a movie like the day after politically? I don't know. I just don't know, and I better not take a guess. But uh, speaking of President Kennedy, I wonder if uh, the 20th anniversary of, of his murder didn't enhance the president's popularity somewhat in this sense. Somehow, I think there's an intuition, Brian, that uh, if Reagan said the same things Kennedy said in his inaugural address, he'd be viciously attacked as a warmonger by the same people who've been eulogizing Kennedy lately, including all these liberals who, uh, who came to prominence as Kennedy lackeys and uh, are now uh, have spent the last 20 years attacking Kennedy's successors for trying to keep his promises. Sonia Johnson, presidential candidate for the Citizens Party uh, nomination, will uh, be here this afternoon at 5 o'clock East Coast time to take your calls. We now go to Portland, Oregon. Good morning. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, uh, after that movie, they showed uh, or Bob McNamara and Kissinger and George Schultz on there, and uh, they were saying that zero, uh, uh, getting back to a zero launch capability or zero warheads and stockpile is not reasonable. And uh, they listed uh, several reasons, one which was uh, because there would be third world countries that could get a hold of this bomb and supposedly uh, bomb someone else and maybe start a chain reaction. Uh, the thing I was curious about is that we seem to have a, a CIA or, or some kind of a network like that. The Russians have the same thing where information is exchanged. We have spy satellites that can see 100 to 150 feet in the ground, supposedly, and see anything that is built. And I was wondering if there isn't a possibility where, so we could be like something like the Israelis. I don't want to be that militant, but when Syria built that breeder reactor in their country and the Israelis waited for them to get it almost completed, then went over and bombed it, couldn't we get to some kind of a situation like that where it would go back to a conventional warfare rather than a nuclear possibility and get to a zero uh, ability to launch? In other words, uh, uh, maybe there may be one nuclear explosion, but there wouldn't be the possibility of 40,000 of these things going off, and that's my question. All right, sir. Joseph Sobran? Well, I, I don't think it's realistic to get back to, uh, to that sort of situation. It's, it's far too late to do what the Israelis did in Iraq, though I agree it should have been done at the time. The, uh, the, the one problem that uh, uh, isn't often enough discussed, I think, is that the Soviet Union depends entirely on its nuclear arsenal for its superpower status. The, the Soviet Union has no attraction to other countries. It, its uh, appeal is entirely negative. It terrorizes. It terrorizes its own people. It terrorizes those around it. This is the essence of socialism, compulsion, and the threat of compulsion. Uh, there's, no, there's no even pretense of democracy there. And it runs its empire the same way it runs its home base by fear. So if, if nuclear weapons were to destroy, its status in the world would be sharply diminished, whereas the status of uh, trading countries like the, uh, uh, like the U.S. and Japan would be greatly enhanced. New York City, you're on with Joe Sobran. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Sobran, um, why, uh, as a person, uh, I'm a person who believes that uh, I'd like to give to my son what my father gave me. In other words, we were handed a great country, we ought to pass it down to our posterity. And uh, after uh, Cap Weinberger said that 
the Iranians did it, aided and abetted by the Syrians, as far as the, the bombing of our um, <clears throat> uh, battalion headquarters at, uh, at Beirut. And then he also said that uh, that he didn't read the president's message as uh, promising to retaliate. And if, if you go back and look at the news conferences, uh, President Reagan did say that you know that we would retaliate. The people would be punished, is what he said. Now I was hoping that at least the United States would do something about it uh, directly. Now I know the Israelis and the French have done something, but the one time we did do something with this Granada right away, the Salvad I, I have the Times here and the Salvadorans. I mean the Nicaraguan Sandinistas are asking the Salvadoran rebels to leave their Managua, and uh, the guy in uh, Suriname threw out the Cubans. I mean action. When we take action, it means something. We get somewhere. So the, you think it's going to hurt? his chances with the right if he doesn't do something and why do you think they haven't done anything so far well there's some uncertainty about who to retaliate against um, so I think that's basically the reason I don't I think Grenada in a way uh, may have saved the president's bacon over Beirut in this uh, New York Times piece this morning uh, which is written off the Heritage Foundation study about the president and his so far in office. You just go down the list. Uh, Dick Allen says uh, good things about the president, but then he says, uh, I wish uh, he would have spent an hour each day assessing the qualifications of personnel down to the level of deputy assistant secretary. Uh, you go down to uh, Howard Phillips. He says Reagan is just the, the sort of nice fellow I'd like to have as a neighbor, but the, uh, he defers too quickly to anyone in a three-piece suit. Uh, later on, uh, uh, Richard Ron, Vice President of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mr. Reagan's agenda has been too modest. Reagan may have been too successful too fast. The, everybody seems to have a positive thing to say, but then they go on to several negative things. Does that uh, bode poorly for him in the future? No, I think it, it means there's an appetite for more of same. They want Reagan to be more Reaganite. I think a very, it's a very hopeful sign for him, and I think he's going to win, by the way, in a huge landslide next year. Go out to Oregon once again. Is this La Grande or La Grande? La Grande. La Grande. Okay, nice to have you with us. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, I have a couple of things. First of all, do you want to know what, what's in our newspaper? Yeah, do you have what, the Oregonian? No, uh, no, I have the uh, local newspaper, the what, Observer. Where, where is La Grande? La Grande is in eastern Oregon, near the Idaho border. Great. And you have a morning paper? Uh, no, it's an afternoon paper, so this would be yesterday afternoon. Yesterday. What do they have on the front page? Well, they have a local story. Uh, about a local man who is, uh, I guess it was part of the Thanksgiving theme. He's grateful because he's for the help he received in recovering from an auto accident. Uh, international news is the PLL rebels uh, turned down the Saudi Arabian, Arabian peace proposal. Uh, coast oil spill, that's an oil spill that happened uh, off the Oregon coast. Uh, they're still, still uh, worried about uh, oil uh, seeping from that ship, which is broken up on a Rock Jetty there. Caller, how do you uh, normally get your news on a daily basis? Uh, both from the uh, from the Observer, I, we read the Oregonian uh, sometimes, and uh, also uh, television news. What did you think of uh, the day after? Did you watch it? Yes. Yeah, I had a. That's primarily why I called. There's a. Uh, first of all, an earlier caller uh, seemed to indicate that the film portrayed the uh, West as invading first, and I guess. I saw a different film <laughs> because uh, uh, the sequence I saw was uh, instability in communist countries, particularly East Germany, where they said there was uh, great unrest and protest. Uh, then they had Soviet troops massing at the uh, Fulda Gap, which I served in Germany and, and uh, know the significance of that. And then the Soviet troops crossed the Fulda Gap, and uh, then the sequence is we fire airburst, nuclear airburst over the advancing Soviet troops, and then the uh, missiles fly. You, and, uh, it, so, it, it sounds oh. like you watched pretty closely. Uh, what did you think of it? Okay, I, you know, it's, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't see the, uh, the uh, great pro-freeze propaganda some people wanted to see. I didn't, uh, didn't, uh, I didn't expect a television movie to be that strong. Uh, I guess, uh, in, in some ways, I think the cons uh, conservative people that attacked it got what they wanted. Uh, they wanted to see a pro-freeze propaganda, and, and in their eyes, that's what it turned out to be. Uh, Let me stop you right there just a second. Do you think a lot of conservatives behind the scenes are saying this really paid off for us? No. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that it uh, necessarily paid off for them. Uh, it uh, certainly gave them some meat for argument, but 
I, I, if, I think the high ratings of the thing are, are largely due to, due to the uh, uh, controversy stirred up by the people who, uh, who uh, were arguing against it uh, prior to the thing even coming on. Uh, for example, I don't think I would have watched it without the controversy that was stirred up over it. One last comment from you, please. Did, you, did it have any impact on your political thinking at all? No. No, I, I'm, I'm really uh, kind of in the middle. I don't totally accept the turn argument or necessarily the freeze argument. Uh, and it didn't sway me in any way. I didn't, I didn't see it as strongly, uh, strongly influencing me to, uh, to uh, support a freeze. You know, one thing, the way the, that nuclear war was set up in the movie, it's, they really spent uh, such, such a little time explaining how the war came about. It just sort of happened. You know, they, uh, which I think somebody who wanted to... Uh, support uh, some political point uh, would have spent some time. They would have, uh, pro-freeze, uh, 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 to support the pro-freeze position, I would think that uh, they would uh, want to spend some time showing uh, showing how that war might build up in, in such a way that would support their uh, scenario of, of, uh, of events. Okay, sir. Joseph Sobran. Well, the bias of the film didn't inhere in so much in what happened during the film or in little nuances in the script is in the very premise of the thing, which is that deterrence fails. The, you, could, you could also make a, a well, of, of course, the excuse that ABC gave was it was a what-if movie, uh, a counterfactual hypothesis, as the philosophers say. You could also make a, a counterfactual film saying, what if communism worked? and show a wonderful communist society in which everyone was happy and then say, well, oh, this is not advocacy of communism, mind you. It, this is just, what if communism worked? Well, it wasn't just, uh, this was not a Disneyland fantasy, obviously. It had a propagandistic intent and impact. By the way, next week, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Shamir will be here in this country and we will have him uh, live at the National Press Club on Wednesday at 1 p.m. if you want to set your schedule. We're going back to the phones right now to Marlton, New Jersey. Good morning. Good morning. You're on, sir. Yes. Uh, my question is basically why do uh, Republican uh, conservatives in general and Republicans in particular, uh, why are they so concerned about seeing uh, the other side of a story? I noticed last night Pat Buchanan saying that uh, there's no hunger in the United States. And I find the same thing with this uh, movie, that they're wondering why uh, people uh, look at this thing from a uh, uh, more abstract point of view, where they see exactly what uh, the other side should like to see. I think we should be able to see both points of view, and Republicans generally do not want to see the other side. Hold it right there, sir. If you stay on the line, I want to let Mr. Sobran respond, then you can come back. Thank you. Well, we get the other side constantly. I mean, there, was, there has never been a film so showing the inside of a Soviet uh, gulag camp, for instance, or even the, the uh, ordinary miseries of life in the Soviet Union. In fact, uh, the, the, the media are quite left in their bias. The, a poll by Robert Lichter and Stanley Rothman a couple of years ago found that 80% of the top media people they polled had voted for the Democratic candidate in each of four consecutive presidential elections. And their views on a wide variety of subjects were far left of most Americans. Uh, they were to the right of the Soviet Union, but far to the left of most Americans. And this, uh, over one period, uh, by the way, speaking of, of nuclear war and the danger of nuclear war, over one two-year period, CBS Evening News devoted less than one minute to the Soviet arms buildup, the greatest arms buildup in history. Uh, there we could have used a little of our side. We got plenty of the other side. We get lots of Soviet denunciations of us supplemented by liberal denunciations of everything that's still uh, fairly conservative in America. So it's uh, not that we want imbalance, but that we'd like a little more balance. Your reaction, Marlton? Uh, yes. Well, I feel that uh, today, as I watch uh, these uh, various rhetorics that are going on television, that uh, they seem not to want to see both sides. I, I just, uh, you know, when the Pat Buchanan thing last night when he said there's no hunger in the United States, it's absolutely uh, incredible to even think that people could not see that. And it's the same here now. I mean, we have 40,000 nuclear weapons. We have enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world twice over. And uh, I don't understand why the buildup continues and why we can't have more rhetoric with the uh, the Russians and get down to talking uh, 
on a more even plane with these people. I mean, they obviously don't want to be destroyed, no more than we do. And I just cannot understand why the Republicans cannot sit down and do something to uh, solve this problem. I just absolutely cannot believe that uh, in this day and age, with the media the way it is, why we can't get a more abstract uh, view of both of our countries. Let me ask you, Carl, do you think the media has any bias at all to it? Uh, I think the media in general has biased in various ways. Uh, whether this movie in particular was biased, I don't know. I think at uh, this point they wanted to see a little more of the other side, and I think that the uh, movie may have done that a little bit, not, not near as much as what I would have liked, because number one, that movie was not near as horrible as it should have been. Mr. Sobran? Well, the... Um <laughs> I don't know where to start. I was quite involved, but uh, there are enough knives in the world to stab everyone several times. Uh, the, the mere quantity of weapons isn't the critical factor here. There's a psychological factor, among other things. There are delivery problems. It's, it is quite complicated. And I, I guess this gentleman is, is complaining that the media are not as strongly biased in his direction as he'd like them to be. They're, they're too biased in his direction, in my opinion. Phoenix, Arizona, good morning. Hello. You're on the air, sir. Uh, this is Alan Cooper. And the point that I wanted to bring up, that there was absolutely no show, nothing shown for any of the oh, possible defense that Ronald Reagan has put forward on oh, ballistic missile defense. Now, the main point I was hoping to bring out is there's uh, another alternative from deterrent or freeze, but defense against the ballistic missiles. Is this uh, program more likely in Congress with this movie being shown? Is the, That's the question I wish to put forth. You understand that uh, question? I yeah. think so. Uh, we should, w will we concentrate more on a defense against nuclear weapons instead of exclusively on building up our own offensive weapons? I hope so. I don't know. Joseph Sobran is the, one of the senior editors of National Review, based here in Washington. He's been with the organization for 11 years. And this morning just happens to have a column on the day, a, a day after, an ABC movie of the last uh, couple of days. Uh, on the commentary page of the Washington Times, and he is joined by Smith Hempstone, who writes about it over here, and Reed Irvine, who writes about it down here. And of course, here's some artwork in the middle to describe uh, the intensity of the issue. Have you been watching at all the ABC Nightline series, uh, The Crisis Game? No. Do you have any feeling uh, about having people like Ed Muskie and James Schlesinger and Clark Clifford playing a game on television? Is that something that uh, you would endorse? Sure. I think it's a good idea. Yes, up to a point. I'd rather see someone other than <laughs> Muskie and uh, Clifford in there, but that's probably interesting and edifying. We have phone lines open for Joe Sobran at 202-628-2525 and 202-783-2727. Ten of Fly, New Jersey, good morning. Uh, good morning. I just have, uh, you know, a comment. You, you seem to be referring to this uh, situation where the conservative in the press this morning, uh, we're not 100 percent in favor of uh, President Reagan. Well, I don't think um, when we had you know, very liberal presidents such as Kennedy and certainly the uh, leftist Carter and Mondale administration that the ADA and other left-wing organizations were 100% for them either. Uh, there was uh, a lot of deviation. Maybe they felt that these presidents weren't liberal enough. And, and obviously there's a certain conservative element in the country that feels its president isn't conservative enough. Well, do you think this is just good copy for a newspaper? Well, I don't think it's a question of that. I think there's no question that there's some, some people, they, you know, uh, some people who call themselves I mean, I consider myself a moderate conservative, and I certainly favor most of what President Reagan is doing. And uh, I, I think there's obviously some people who are always going to say, well, he's not doing enough or he's not leaning in, enough in that direction. But, uh, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to say that this story means that conservatives don't support Reagan, because every conservative that I know uh, does support Reagan, and certainly considering any possible alternative, uh, you know, feels that Reagan is, uh, is, is the man. Well, what if, just, just for talking purposes, what if the president decided not to run? Who would be your, your first choice to, to, to uh, replace him? <laughs> That's too difficult. I, uh, I, um, 
I'd like to see a Jack Kemp in there, although I don't know whether he has, if he has enough support, uh, you know, and enough uh, recognition. I'd have to say I'd go with George Bush. I don't know that his conservative credentials are there, but I think um, from the standpoint of experience and from the standpoint of intelligence and from the standpoint of uh, what I believe he stood for through the years, uh, I'd have to uh, say Bush, and I think a Bush Kemp ticket might be uh, really good. Uh, that's a personal preference. I, I, I would really be devastated at this point if the president didn't run because I think he has the best chance of winning, and I think he's a great, great president. Uh, but I do have a question, or sort of a question, concerning the, um, uh, the, the film, The Day After. Which, uh, I was really disturbed. I wouldn't watch it, and I didn't want anyone in my family to watch it because I didn't think it, uh, it should have been shown at this point. And I'm just wondering, was it a coincidence that we have a film like this produced and shown just that we're talking about deploying nuclear weapons in Germany and uh, in other allied countries. Um, you know, since the days of McCarthy, everybody's a little hard-pressed to say, well, are there, is there infiltration in the press, and, and could there be a couple uh, at ABC? But let's face it, uh, the KGB has bought uh, our secrets from people in, um, uh, that work in, in, in plants in California and, and defense-related type of activities, and could they just have one or two uh, floating around ABC, uh, pushing their point of view for them, maybe paying them? I, I don't know. It's a far-fetched question, perhaps, but uh, it's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. All right, sir. Tenafly, New Jersey. Appreciate the call. Joe Sobrand? Well, I think it's conceivable. Uh, the, we, we know the Soviets are very active. They have an enormous espionage network. The KGB is estimated to have as many as some say a million employees. That, I think that expresses a love of, of round numbers, but uh, 300 to 400,000 seems to be a pretty conservative guess. The late Congressman Larry McDonald, who was shot down, of course, in the uh, KAL-7 airliner, used to tease uh, some of his fellow conservatives a bit. Uh, when they, would, when they would tease him with believing in the conspiracy theory, he'd say, well, you believe in the coincidence theory. It's a bit much to think that after 40 years of nuclear weapons, the one, it's mere chance that the first movie on national television to show the horrors of nuclear war should occur at just this moment. Let me quote to you from Reed Irvine's column this morning, two different quotes, uh, so that the audience can get some perspective on at least where the ABC people are coming from. Leonard Goldenson, chairman of the board of ABC, denies uh, such a thing. Quote, this is a motion picture of an event without advocacy, intention, and without postulation. We are making every effort to maintain this objective, unquote. And the other quote is Mr. Uh, Ed Hume, who was, I believe, the producer on this the script, writer. script writer, excuse me. Uh, quote, I think things are out of control and I'm scared, unquote, were his quotes that uh, had to do with disarmament. Fountain Valley, California, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I was uh, talking to uh, my friend the other day. We were watching the movie that there, uh, the day after. And uh, I believe that uh, the movie was very biased. Uh, and there was three or four points in it that showed us as the culprit. And uh, especially when the Russian was interviewed on TV, he said he had 1,600 uh, or 2,400, something like that, uh, missiles pointed at the border. And that's a blatant lie. And the second place, uh, when they attacked, we have fired the first shot of a nuclear weapon over the uh, troops. And uh, that made us a culprit. And I just believe that uh, it was really biased. Do you think that, that uh, we should have such movies on television? Is there any reason why that they should be stopped? Well, I believe it should be, that it could be shown on both sides. And we know Russia will not show that kind of movie to the people, that's for sure. Do you think the government should get involved to stop this kind of movie from being on television, or is this just the price we pay and from your perspective in a free society? Well, I believe uh, if it could be completely, uh, you know, uh, unbiased, fine, but uh, it's pointing out the figure to uh, us all the time. The news uh, commentaries in the paper, Israel does something, we do something, it's always blasted across the front page. But uh, when they do something, it's, uh, you don't hear about all the, the murders behind the, behind the lines back there, and all the things that go on. It's, it's terrible. And I thought it was really a, a bad piece of All right, sir. Thank, uh, thank you very much for the call from Fountain Valley. Let me ask you that, Joe Sobrand. Uh, it sounds radical, I know, but should the government be involved then to create this balance? 
No, it, I don't think so, but it ought to be, uh, it ought to more aggressively counteract propaganda from the left, whether it's from the Soviet Union or private uh, citizens in the U.S. Let me go back to your comment earlier about the president overreacting from the White House on the movie. Do you get into kind of a catch-22 problem when you're trying to, to provide balance if you don't, don't agree with what something the media is doing? You bring attention to it? Uh, that's a danger. I think you should only answer propaganda directly in order to uh, strengthen the point you want to make, not merely to negate their point. Wiscasset, Maine. Go ahead, please. Are you with us? Yeah. All right, sir. I'm sorry. We had a little problem there. Go ahead. Uh, this is from Mr. Sobran. I wonder if he's read Brigadier General Sir John Hackett's book, World War III. No, I haven't. Well, it makes very interesting reading from British intelligence. And their feeling, his feeling, is that uh, the Russians, uh, after being caught short before World War I, with barely 15% enough uh, rifles and ammunition to equip their troops, and the same again in World War II, have now built up such a colossal machine with excess of 50,000 armored vehicles and over 50,000 aircraft. They can't afford to let this rust. And uh, his feeling is that this whole thing is going to start in a conventional way in August 8, 1985. And... Uh, what he says uh, makes more sense than any of the arguments for a nuclear war uh, that have been put forward by anybody. The Russian plan is that they can reach the English Channel in four days. And to me, this makes much more sense than a nuclear exchange. I wondered if you had any ideas about that. Thank you, Ms. Cassett. I really don't know enough about military matters to say anything. It even sounds authoritative, I'm afraid, but uh, it... it it sounds plausible in a way, and yet it would be so risky for them actually to invade NATO territory. I don't think they'll, they're likely to take that approach. I think they're likely to try to choke us off in the uh, Mideast or something like that, obliquely. What impact has uh, the fact that you're now published in a Washington paper, the Washington Times, had on you in the Washington environment? Do you, do you notice any change since the old days when you were published in the National Review and papers outside of Washington? Well, I was uh, in the Washington Post for a while, too. Um, well, that's right. You were, weren't you? Yeah. Well, they published one a week? Yeah, for a while there, and for about a year. I don't know. I say I just moved back to, I just moved to Washington myself. I didn't live in Washington. Where were you before? Oh, uh, uh, Princeton, uh, New Jersey, in that general area. What do you think of the Washington environment since you've been here? Oh, I love it. I really, I really think Washington's a just most beautiful city in America. But what about the, the uh, political stimulation? Do you find that Love here? It. Is, it, is it as good as you've seen anywhere else? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I love what's going on now because Washington's a city full of ideas as well as events. Grand Junction, Colorado, good morning. Good morning, yes. Uh, uh, I was wondering what he thought of William S. Buckley. I, uh, I watched this pompous poop uh, so many times and, and it looks as if uh, when he can't put some, use the put down on someone else, he can't have a, a logical argument. I like Carl Sagan's comments, and I think that we are moving dangerously toward Nazism, and I think that William F. Buckley would, uh, would make a good leader for him. Connor, are you just basically politically opposed to the right uh, side of the political fence? Uh, well, it's just, uh, I heard him... Uh, in an interview one time talking about the Vietnam War, and he said the only thing wrong with the Vietnam War was we didn't have enough backbone. He said that uh, we got tired after 54,000 of our troops were killed, and uh, we should have sent more kids in there. Now, that's great when you can sit back here and live in that uh, over-there syndrome like many of our leaders seem to live in now. We'll deploy missiles over there. We'll have our little wars over there and beware over there, we're coming. And uh, I think that's a sad, frightening situation, that you can't pull these people into our century from the 1930s until and to, to now and make them realize that the next war will be the final war. All right, sir, thank you very much. And I want Joseph Sobran to look into the lens and tell the audience what he really thinks of Bill Buckley, his boss. Well, <laughs> he's... I, I'll be suspect if I say it because he's, he's a lovely man. I've worked for him for 11 years. I just want to say something generally, though, about this, this kind of remark. 
uh, Nazism. I mean, the, the, the right in America has had to put up with this for a long time, being likened to Nazis. Nazism is an abbreviation for National Socialism, best kept secret on the left. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, you are not to this day allowed to refer to National Socialism. It is illegal. It's always referred to as fascism or Hitlerism. Now, conservatives stand for limited and decentralized government. And this illiterate and uh, morally obscene heckling of conservatives as proto-Nazis is something I deeply object to. I want to welcome a group of uh, visiting Japanese professors and teachers from Osaka University in Japan. They're here in our studios this morning, and we may... Uh, I think we're going to, yeah, we have a shot on the, on the screen right now. We want to thank you for coming. Uh, we have a few more minutes, and we'll get a chance to visit with you later. But we appreciate you taking time on our day after Thanksgiving, which is a holiday here in the United States, to be with us uh, here in the studios. There are many of them are specialists in telecommunications studying the cable television industry here in the United States. And when you find out what it's all about, let us know, because we're anxious to find out ourselves. Sweetwater, Texas, you're on with Joseph Sobrand. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Brian. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to say, first let me just say this. Do you know I've watched you now for about, I guess, a year and a half, and I could not begin to tell how you feel about anything, and I love that. Well, I, I appreciate that. If you said anything else, I'd be very concerned. Well, I wish we had more of it. Thank you. Uh, if you, you want to know what's on the Dallas Morning News? You bet. All right. Soviets pledge uh, nuclear arms buildup on land at sea, and uh, Israel trades 46 hundred to PLO for six soldiers and PLO faction okay triple E ceasefire. You notice how uh, when when the Congress is out of town a lot of the front pages around the country have a lot more foreign news on it. Oh yeah sure. What? Uh, Abilene paper has uh, White House security strengthened. Well that's interesting I, I did not show our audience uh, and it's actually on the front page of the New York Times it's also in the Washington Post uh, they had uh, seven dump trucks full of sand in front of the White House yesterday. Right. A access to the White House is impeded by dump trucks and security move. By the way, who wrote the piece on, uh, in the Abilene paper? Uh, it's AP. AP story. Mm -hmm. what, uh, thank you very much. You did a good job, sir. What are you thinking about? Uh, you, did you watch the movie a day after? Sure did. What was your reaction? I thought it was a dud. Why? Um, I'm real wishy-washy. I'm very easily manipulated, and I, I realize that I am. I, re I had my tissues, I was ready to be devastated, and I just simply wasn't. Uh, on the beach, what was that, 25 years ago or so, affected me much more than this movie. Why, I, uh, why do you think, some of, the, uh, some of the analysts suggest that we've been bombarded with so many negative things over the last 25 years, assassinations, assassination attempts, wars, and all that, that we are kind of... I don't know what, desensitized, sensitized. I, I agree. Uh, I, I know that I am. Say, I was raised, you know, you went to the Roy Rogers movie. If someone got shot and, and fell off the horse, of course, there was never any blood, but you averted your head. You could not bear to watch it. And my children can watch things that just destroy me. Now, I didn't allow them to watch this. Our 17-year-old did. And he, he, his philosophy was, so what else is new? We know it's horrible. What about your political philosophy? Are you... Uh, I'm pretty moderate. So you were ready to be um, uh, impacted by the movie and you can't... I really was. I thought, okay, this, you know, I, it's going to force me to uh, make an unpleasant decision here. And it, all I could think of was, how do we stop them? <laughs> I mean, it, it, I, it didn't do it for me. Now, I, you know, I can't speak uh, for anyone else, but I know just my friends here, all, we all seem to feel the same way. It, it really did not affect us as we thought it would. you have a question for Joe Sobrand? Yes, I do. Uh, Georgie Ann Geyer had a, an interesting column the other day. I really like her. And uh, she was talking about a new generation of journalists. Now, I'm going to paraphrase this, of course. But she said that these new journalists see themselves as uh, more or less above the average individual and uh, therefore th believe that they should be uh, leading public opinion rather than reporting to the public. And I'd like to know what your guest thinks of that. Thank you, Sweetwater. Well, that's one of the things I was complaining about, ma'am. It was uh, uh, one of the findings of the, of, of the Lichter-Rothman research that I mentioned, not only that the 
that uh, people in the media uh, tend to be very liberal, but that they very often tend to view themselves as sort of missionaries whose role it is to change American society. There was a big controversy about this in the early 70s, whether the media should be objective or uh, advocacy uh, media. And the general compromise that was reached was adversary media. Now, this was supposed to avoid the overt commitment to ideology of some sort, but in point of fact, the, the media, when they assume this adversary role, almost always take it toward the United States and toward the conservative institutions of the United States, not toward the big bureaucracies, the great society. There was no adversary press for that, not toward the activist courts. These things all come to come out, tend to come out favorably in the news media. By the way, Brian, may I compliment you on your professionalism? I must say you do do it very straight. I appreciate that. Thank you, Joe. So, Brian, let's take our last call from Palm Springs, California. Yes, first of all, I'd like to suggest to the previous mail caller who compared the right to Nazism, uh, do a little bit more study of the history of socialism. Um, getting back to what I'd like to talk about here, um, it seems to bother me that why so many people, especially socialists or uh, Democrats, liberals, uh, keep using the word Russian and they completely miss the word communist. And they say, why can't we have, have a build down? Why can't we have a freeze? And they completely miss the point that the communist government does not re represent the Russian people, never have. They only represent their political ideals, and the Russian people are nothing more than fodder to reach their ideals. They don't consider their lives. Uh, a citizen in Russia, if he does not uh, do what the government says, if he cannot hold a job to what they want, they label him a parasite and either put him in a labor camp or in a mental hospital. Okay, final comment from our caller today. Joe Sobrand, want to wrap it up? Well, the, the uh, Russian people are very great people. In fact, from, 19, from 1850 to the revolution, they produced more great literature, uh, music, and uh, culture in general, I'd say, than, than I think this country has in its entire existence. And I'm not putting down this country when I say that. But it all stopped with the revolution. Uh, more specifically with the communist coup, which occurred several months after the real revolution. I don't blame the revolution, I blame communism for that. The German people are very great people. I love them dearly, but uh, when they had a bad regime, there was trouble. That's how it happens. Joe Sobrand is a graduate of Eastern Michigan University, where he got a graduate degree. He's also from that town, uh, where the university is located, Ypsilanti. Is that the way you pronounce it? Ypsilanti? Yes, Ypsilanti. Michigan? Most people say Ypsilanti because it starts with a Y. And he is the C a senior editor for National Review, has been there for 11 years and is now based in Washington. Also writes a column for the Los Angeles Times Syndicate twice a week and you ought to peek in your newspaper around the country to find out if Joseph Sobrand's column is in there this morning. We're out of time. You all have a nice weekend. Thank you.
If everybody is seated, I think we can get started now. We know you've all had a long, hard,